As the fight over Lyme disease continues, a story unfolds bringing powerful players in the fields of medicine and politics. Advocates and authors, patients and professionals from all walks of life with one common goal, to eradicate an illness that has permeated millions of lives for far too long. With the discovery of new treatments, new tools, new policies, and new theories, the power of innovation cannot be denied as all sides look for answers in this ongoing battle against Lyme. We're here in Riverhead, Long Island, Suffolk County, in the Cranberry Bog Preserve. It is here that researchers have discovered ticks linked to other vector-borne illnesses in addition to Lyme. It's these types of discoveries that have opened the door to innovative steps in medicine and beyond. For the next half hour, we'll examine these groundbreaking advances, from the research of an old drug that could serve a new purpose for Lyme patients, to a new type of experience that's giving patients and doctors a chance to share their stories. And later, I sit down with author Chris Newby, whose book Bitten exposes the theory of ticks used as a biological weapon. But first, let me take you back to December 2018, Washington, D.C., a new chapter in an ongoing debate when a group of professionals historically at odds over how to handle Lyme came together in what can only be described as a watershed moment in the fight against it. And we were there. There's so much history in Lyme and so much controversy, and people see this as such a politicized issue that many scientists and many researchers choose not to get involved. And so we're missing a lot of great people who could help us move the conversation forward. Lyme, there's no question that the topic has led to a heated debate, and if there's one place that's become a virtual breeding ground for contentious dialogue, it is right here in the nation's capital. But it was in this town on December the 4th of last year when members of government, industry, academia, research, and patient advocacy put their differences aside and convened at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for what would be known as the first ever Lyme Innovation Roundtable. So really have two goals. One is can our office at the HHS CTO uh, collaborate with philanthropists and nonprofits who have come to the table today to really scale Lyme innovation. Put money behind it, put strategy behind it, put resources from all sectors. The other one is really about data interoperability and we're going to come to solutions much faster if institutions are collecting data in one shared way and we're able to scale that data across multiple places to find complex patterns that otherwise if data was in individual institutions or siloed we would not be able to see. Another milestone moment in the fight against Lyme is the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. Established by Congress as part of the 21st Century Cures Act, this diverse panel of experts is tasked with delivering a full report every two years. The goal? To uncover the problems that have persisted for far too long. But collecting this data and these ideas from those on the forefront of the fight against Lyme is just the first step. The next step in curing Lyme? might actually happen right here on Capitol Hill. Most of government has lagged behind Lyme disease and has private research. Only in the last five, six years has it gotten prominence. But this report that HHS put out is a blueprint. Now we have to enact it. We are number one in Lyme disease and Long Island is number one in New York. Senate Minority Leader Charles Schumer is among the staunchest of advocates on the Hill. And back at home, the issue of Lyme is undeniable and indisputable. I'm pushing this as hard as I can because I know people who've had Lyme disease. I had it myself once, although I caught it in time. Um, and this is a place where dollars, a relatively small amount of dollars, federal government speaking, will make a huge difference because there's been so little done in the past. As a result, there is some action taking place in D.C. 
U.S. Senators Susan Collins and Tina Smith have introduced what's being called the Tick Act, which would establish an Office of Oversight and Coordination for Vector-Borne Disease at the Department of Health and Human Services. It would also authorize CDC grants at $20 million a year for early detection, diagnosis, and treatment. Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey is sponsoring the bill in the House. It'll drive additional funding for the National Institutes of Health. We spent a mere $11 million at the Centers for Disease Control on tick-borne diseases. That's almost laughable. And with the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group now in its second phase, the members of this new term hope to continue the progress that has already begun as they get ready to deliver another report in 2020. Next, inspiring people with Lyme disease to share their stories. How one hospital is helping patients find their voice. Stay tuned. Some people with Lyme face a lifelong uphill battle. Now Mount Sinai Hospital is encouraging patients to share their struggles. Linda Schmidt has their stories. Singer-songwriter Jesse Rubin has written a song about his personal struggle with Lyme disease. I have too many questions and places to go. It is a struggle that has taken him to the darkest of places. There was a long period in there where I was worried I was going to die. There was a period in there where I wanted to. Jesse shared his story, recording it in a Lyme Stories booth at Mount Sinai Hospital. I was getting these weird symptoms, like these crawling sensations under my skin, and I was uh, tired all the time and sort of like dizzy and nauseous. The hospital takes the booth on the road to record testimonials from anyone connected to Lyme disease and post their stories on social media. I would say the thing that is most misunderstood is really just how bad uh, people In, feel the challenge. Invisible disability, new onset psychiatric symptoms. I think Lyme is an area where there is a lot of need. We wanted to create an opportunity for patients to share their stories, share their journey, and educate the world and educate the community about what they're going through and hopefully feel empowered by connecting their experience to other experiences like theirs. The booth is like a small office space and it's brand new, so there's lots of light in here. It feels very comfortable. They even have flowers. This is the microphone that's going to be recording whatever it is that you have to say. You just sit down in the chair, you get comfortable, you hit the green button, and the whole process begins. What would you want to tell someone who was just diagnosed with Lyme disease? Lyme disease is often misdiagnosed, misunderstood, and stigmatized. I ended up going to like 14 or 15 doctors, and they all were like, either there's nothing wrong, or I know exactly what's wrong, and I'll be able to fix you. It's a very complex disorder, and many people have not gotten the care and the treatment that they need early on in their process, and they often feel alone and isolated. Lyme disease led to paralysis and life in a wheelchair for Julia Bruzzese. She was previously featured in our Lyme and Reason series. I had to learn how to be strong for this. My normal life was taken away from me. A healthy life that became filled with hospitals, doctors, medications, MRIs, blood tests, a spinal tap. Julia has also recorded her painful struggle in the Lyme booth and her hope. In the best case scenario, I hope that a patient can go to the hospital or can go to a mainstream doctor and get the right care, that there will be a better path for people who suffer. So many people, even in the medical community, are just so far behind as far as how serious this condition is and how big of an epidemic that it is. Hopefully this brings awareness to a lot of people, not just medical professionals, but just the public at large. Ticks used as weapons of war. Next, the book that's shedding light on a new theory on how Lyme may have been man-made when we come back. The power of innovation allows us to dive into new territories and new theories. And one of those theories revolves around biological warfare. Ticks being used as weapons of war. We don't just do research and it ends there, Sam. We have to defend ourselves against the other maniacs who are developing biological weapons. That's the way the game is played. 
It was once a scene only plausible in movies like Outbreak. The government using microbes as a form of contagion, a chance to see if animals or insects could be turned into weapons of war. But new, unearthed CDC, CIA, Department of Defense, and Army documents from as far back as the 50s detail a secret history of biological warfare with ticks as the weapon of choice. And so that started this five-year research journey, investigating the U.S. biological weapons program as related to six- and eight-legged creatures, insects, um, arthropods. Chris Newby is a science writer at Stanford and a senior producer of the award-winning Lyme-focused documentary, Under Our Skin. There's Lyme disease everywhere. It's more prevalent than AIDS. How many more people are going to suffer before the truth comes out? But it is her latest project that's raising eyebrows. Bitten, the secret history of Lyme disease and biological weapons, reads like fiction, but Newby says it's all based on government documents detailing the U.S. implementation of a covert program that dropped Lyme-infected ticks over wide swaths of the U.S. and Caribbean. The unraveling of a secret long held by Wooly Bergdorfer, a U.S. scientist and the man who discovered Lyme. A lot of the files I found in Willie's garage, he had hidden some of the files from an NIH, National Institutes of Health archivist, and towards the end of his life, he released it to a BYU professor because he wanted to archive these. He started feeling guilty, I think, about these experiments he did. The documents were turned over to Newby as she writes in Bitten, if Willie's claim was true, a crime against humanity had been committed by the U.S. government and then covered up. I felt like it was my responsibility as a citizen of the planet to, like, follow it through. I found an eyewitness who dropped poison ticks on Cuba right after the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The military wanted to injure Castro and the economy so that Castro would be overthrown. According to Bitten, Willie worked for two decades in programs that operated along the same guidelines as the U.S. Nuclear Weapons Project. So it had all the rules of secrecy of that program, too, so it was very hard to get the information. One of the best sources of information on that program was Willie, who worked 20 years in that program, weaponizing fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. There was an Army-funded study in Norfolk, Virginia, which is on the Atlantic Bird Flyway Zone. And they radiated those ticks and carefully put a thousand ticks in grids and then traced them with Geiger counters how far they would spread over three years. And of course, tens of thousands of those ticks were picked up by birds. And a year after those experiments started, this aggressive tick was starting to spread aggressively on Long Island. In fact, Newby's book has already led to action in D.C., an amendment to a federal defense spending bill sponsored by New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith and passed by the full House of Representatives, directs the Inspector General of the Department of Defense to investigate the possible involvement of DOD biowarfare labs in the weaponization of Lyme disease in ticks and other insects from 1950 to 1975. It usually takes an act of Congress to say we want complete and thorough answers on what was happening in these labs, how many people were involved, how many ticks from where, and we may even find knowing what was packed into these insects to turn them into deadly agents. Fox 5 reached out to DOD. They wouldn't comment on the proposed legislation, but they did give us a statement. Quote, DOD takes extreme care in all of our research programs to ensure the protection of our personnel and the community. Newby's book is as much an origin story as it is a detailed analysis of how the U.S. arrived at a place where Lyme and co-infections could become so wildly out of control the Centers for Disease Control can't even give an accurate estimate as to how many Americans are impacted yearly. It is also a chance for Willy Bergdorfer to right a wrong, a chance to speak from the grave and tell the world how this epidemic truly came to be and what's needed to get rid of it. I come to appreciate how he got sucked into the bioweapons program and then he couldn't get out. And so he was stuck in Hamilton, Montana with this legacy and after a while I think it ate at his soul and credit to him that he finally released the information to some journalists so we could let it be known and I, and I would just really wish that the military would declassify these documents because it would save a lot of research dollars. Because we'll be able to at least know the origins. Right, and know how to treat it.
One of the biggest unsolved mysteries when it comes to fighting Lyme, how to cure those with chronic symptoms. Now a drug that's been used to fight an entirely different kind of chronic condition is giving researchers a renewed sense of hope. Antoine Lewis explains. Unlike other bacterial infections where you have large numbers of bacteria in the body and they're relatively easy to treat with antibiotics, Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, you find very few of them in the body. And we're now beginning to understand through GLA-funded research that there may be persistent bacteria that are tolerant to antibiotics like doxycycline. Solving the enigma of how to prevent and treat Lyme disease beyond antibiotics has been a challenge for researchers. So Kim Lewis actually ran a drug discovery program and discovered that disulfiram, a drug that's used for the treatment of alcoholism, was actually very effective at killing Borrelia burgdorferi in all its forms. That success during in vitro testing led Dr. Lewis and his team to test the effectiveness of the drug on mice. And it appears that in the mouse model, the blood denatures the disulfiram so quickly that it only uh, would kill spirochetes for about 10 minutes. Dr. Brian Fallon is the director of the Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Research Center at Columbia University Medical Center. It's there where a clinical study of disulfiram on human patients is now underway. If you give the standard dose to humans, 250 milligrams for example, it would actually kill the Lyme disease spirochete for about three days, if they're there. But could this be the game changer that has evaded the medical community for so long as they try to help those living with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? One could say there's a lot of hype right now about disulfiram being helpful, but we're not going to know until it's really carefully studied in a scientific manner. We have to find new drugs so that we have covered all of the bases. Next, how one woman has turned her experience of living with Lyme into a fashion statement, and more importantly, a business when we return. Now to living with a purpose. One young woman is looking to revolutionize the fashion industry. It is a business born of her ongoing Lyme battle. My name is Emily Levy, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mighty Well. Mighty Well might not be a brand you know, but there's a high probability you will someday. Not only for what it represents, but for the force propelling it. And I started just being open about my story as a patient going through Lyme. And the more I started opening up, the more people started to say, hey, I was going through, you know, something similar. Emily Levy's story begins at the age of 12. A bite from a tick altered the course of her life. She spent the majority of her days as the patient, hooked up to machines, waiting for a drip of medication. Too sick to play, too weak to eat, too tired to think. And I actually wasn't able to finish the seventh grade. The doctors just said it was the worst case of mono that they had ever seen. Um, and then they went on to tell my mom that it could even be leukemia. Not leukemia, but Lyme, chronic neurological Lyme, existing with a pick and now a port. The telltale sign that Emily isn't like the rest, not the same as high school classmates or fellow Babson College friends. I was told to wear a cut sock on my arm to protect my pick line. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Because previously I could hide, you know, what I was going through, but now once I was doing two to five IV infusions per day on a college campus, people could tell that something was wrong. And I really became known as that girl with the cut sock on her arm. Out of adversity, opportunity. The chance to change and champion what is known as adaptive wear. I started learning about all these sportswear fabric technologies that have been developed for athletes. And I said, you know, why can't we take those fabrics that have antimicrobials and moisture wicking properties and apply them to the medical industry? While in college, Emily and her best friend began Mighty Well, a fashion and accessories line aiming to help patients adapt to a life where constant medical care is a necessity. One out of three Americans has a chronic condition. I believe that just because you're sick doesn't mean that you have to live a sick life. And the idea is taking off. What started as a school project is now a bona fide business. With Emily as the face of the brand, Mighty Well is winning business competitions and hearts and minds. Products that tell a story while tapping into the purchasing power of patients. I've been in treatment going on six years now. 
I've had three pick lines. I now have an implanted port. I'm going to be able to fulfill those dreams um, that I never thought were possible. Innovation, information, education, those are the keys to solving the mystery surrounding Lyme disease. For that reason, we have posted this entire show and all of our interviews on our website, fox5ny.com, and also on our YouTube page. Thanks for joining us. For all of us here at Fox 5, I'm Teresa Priolo. Goodbye.